so much, Jennifer, for that very generous introduction and for the warm welcome here to the Western States Rhetoric and Literacy Group. Um, I want to thank you for welcoming me here today and to add my thanks to the Canada Research Chairs Program and to the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada for funding my research. Well, the expanding field of transnational studies claims that movement between nations is more than a theme to be studied. These mobilities demand new modes of analysis that can go beyond the limitations of academic fields in which the nation state still constitutes the norm. So this is one of the challenges we face today. Ulrich Beck, a sociologist studying globalization, terms this reliance on the nation state as the normative category for analysis, methodological nationalism. And he deplores it as part of the grammar of the social sciences that obscures ability to understand how the world operates in globalizing conditions. Well, the term is disputed methodological nationalism, it has entered the rhetoric of globalization studies and it contributes to shaping how new literacies are being framed. Jahan Ramazani names a related tendency within comparative and national literary studies, what he calls the mononational paradigm. In critiquing methodological nationalism as a dominant grammar that frames understanding, Beck proposes instead the new grammar of a methodological cosmopolitanism. Ramazzani also seeks to develop a cosmopolitan methodology that can replace the mononational paradigm. He critiques the idea that any nation state could be monocultural and shut itself off from external influences. So the emphasis differs, but both affirm that in naturalizing the nation state as the default frame for analysis, these approaches are outdated and inadequate to the scholarly task of understanding modernity in the globalizing phase. Implicitly, they are also suggesting that the national frame is an insufficient context for literacy and citizenship education in contemporary times. What is needed to understand transnational connectivities are new forms of transnational literacies. But how to describe these? The definition of transnational literacies is disputed and it varies according to the fields in which it features. Education as a field is transforming rapidly in response to globalizing pressures. Yet for many teachers in the system, local and national frames remain significant even if they are being redescribed as global, multicultural, multilingual and transnational. In this paper I'm going to be asking some questions about the implications for literacy, cultural and rhetorical studies of these shifts in emphasis. In making their critiques, Beck and Ramazzani contribute to the emergent rhetorics associated with globalization and transnational analysis. Insofar, however, as these critiques of nation-based analysis are forming a new critical consensus, it remains valuable to consider what approaches they close off as well as what new insights they enable. So this is the task of a decolonizing theoretical approach which seeks to develop its own version of transnational literacies. To speak of transnational literacies is to invoke an emergent way of thinking about literacy in which both narrow and extended usages coexist. As Harvey Graff notes, and I'm quoting him here, claims about literacies and their lack surround us, multiplying like metaphorical insects. So today I'm going to map my own exploratory route through these insect hordes and the buzzes they create. I'm working with a small international and interdisciplinary team, as you heard, funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada to develop transnational literacies in the context of an exchange between academics working in Brazil and Canada.
Our project aims to further thinking about what transnational literacies involve and how we can develop them within our diverse constituencies. Several of our members are also part of a Brazilian national project headed by professors Valkyria Montemor and Professor Linmario Menezes de Souza, both at the University of Sao Paulo. Their project is developing critical literacies in the teaching of English in their classrooms and in the design of educational policy. So our team met earlier this week in Toronto and we met yesterday at the University of Manitoba. We are here today and we look forward to discussing our work with you. Uh, we don't always agree and our work is in progress. So what follows will be my view of some of what is at stake in our project. Ronald Jacobs and Eleanor Townsley distinguish between a globalizing logic that imagines a unitary global space that organizes academic debate and a transnational logic that envisions a series of overlapping academic debates often organized within a national context that is in the process of cosmopolitan, global and transnational transformation. So I associate Beck with the first the global unitary sphere and Ramazani with the second, the overlapping spheres, but the boundaries blur. This useful distinction between a globalizing logic and a transnational logic helps nuance understanding of the frames through which globalization rhetorics function today. These two logics incorporate different approaches to cross-cultural engagement in a world where these engagements are believed to be increasing. There is a unitary global space organizing many academic fields today. It is centered on publication in English, still mainly based in the West, and ranked through citation indexes. Yet the transnational logic of attending to the overlapping debates emerging from many geopolitical locations is gaining ground, and we seek to facilitate that gain. It can be found at its best in much decolonial and post-colonial work. It can be seen in Faisal Rizvi's advocacy of cosmopolitan learning allied with a critical cosmopolitanism. And in the many arguments made for decolonizing intercultural education, for decolonizing various disciplinary formations, almost every discipline has its argument now for how it should be decolonizing, and arguments for de-imperializing hegemonic universalisms. Here I'm thinking of a, a very interesting uh, recent book called Asia as Method. So together, these approaches indicate the need for knowledge producers to operate at multiple scales of engagement simultaneously and to adjust our interventions to the demands of the context in which we are acting. So there's also a strong globalizing logic at play in current debates about globalization. A global public sphere does seem to be emerging, albeit unevenly and still dominated by elites. But globalizing processes themselves are not always homogenizing. Some dimensions of transnational rhetoric reinforce the notion of a unitary global sphere. Others complicate it through reference to multi-scalar engagements, and others seek to decolonize it. But decolonization itself can take many forms, leading to varieties of diversality, multipolarity, reconfiguration, or transformation in thinking about relations of the local and global, and refusing binary oppositions between universal and particular. Transnationalism is a tricky and seductive concept that can be used to various ends. At its most basic, it recognizes that nation states still matter, but that their functions within the global system are changing. To use the transnational, then, to modify key terms, such as rhetoric and literacy, is to introduce further complications. How each of us defines transnational literacy depends on where we stand within the current debates about transnationalism and how each one of us assesses the needs of the places in which we work. 
So our team locates itself within the national and local educational systems of two countries, Canada and Brazil, each of which is changing its understandings of how it operates in the global sphere. Who needs to be transnationally literate? Who is best suited to teach transnational literacies? What difference does it make to modify literacy with this adjective or to pluralize literacy? The answers to these questions are not obvious. However, we think that public schools and public universities have a role to play. We can ensure that the definition of transnational literacies is not reduced to skill development alone. So education is subject to globalizing pressures but remains a local and national jurisdiction in the Americas with private for-profit companies, many of them with a global reach, seeking to increase their market share at the expense of state-run institutions in many regions. Certainly this is the case in Brazil. At the same time, National governments are increasingly anxious to internationalize their systems, with Brazil offering a range of new scholarships to send their students overseas, and many recent reports in Canada advocating similar initiatives. Business in both countries is urging these changes. So these calls for international experience and intercultural competencies are usually presented within a nationalist rhetoric of enhancing national competitiveness globally. Yet they still meet with considerable nationalist opposition. Literacy has long been seen to have a nationalist function. In predominantly Anglophone countries and now also in the emerging global sphere, literacy is still often mistakenly conflated with learning English, as it was during the colonial era. So arguments, as you know, for national forms of cultural literacy associated with the work of E.D. Hirsch Jr. in his book Cultural Literacy, What Every American Needs to Know, published in 1987, although it was seriously attacked by advocates of critical literacy, did successfully deploy the crisis rhetoric of its times to influence curricular debates and to heighten public anxiety about national competitiveness in a changing world. Harvey Graff's important corrective historical work on the long history of literacy, literacy debates identifies such crisis rhetoric as routinely linked to literacy and wider educational debates throughout the centuries. Yet, Hirsch's simplistic, list-based, and ethnocentric approach to literacy now seems to be repeated in many of the neoliberal calls for developing competencies appropriate to the emergent knowledge economy and its proliferation of new technologies. The crisis rhetoric around the inadequacies of the North American educational system assumes new threats to first world national economies and continues to invoke crisis to create the anxiety that might lead to structural readjustment. We know that critical literacy and rhetorical studies can help us understand and resist such crisis rhetoric. In a useful survey article in uh, PMLA's series on the changing profession, Wendy Hesford notes what she terms a growing interest in multilingual learners and in multiliteracies and the mediation of cultural practices in a digital age. These are the foci of our team project. At the same time, however, I also see what Hesford calls a reactionary resurgent localism and a strategic retreat to disciplinary homelands calls for a critical cosmopolitanism and a critical localism have both emerged in response to globalization's contradictory pressures. Like Graf, Hesford concludes that, as she puts it, the global turn requires a comparative historical frame and a broader understanding of culture, text, context, and the public sphere than what traditional rhetorical and ethnographic criticism provides. In her view, and I quote again, 
as rhetorical scholarship reorients itself toward an examination of the global, it will increasingly need to pursue interdisciplinary and collaborative work. Well, so I approach these questions from the other side of the divide that Hesford sees separating scholars in rhetoric, composition, and literacy studies from those, like myself, trained in literary studies. We're all coming to recognize the need for integration of our various interests in studying the production, circulation, reception triad that characterizes what we do with texts, along with the congruence of our interests and the disabling impact of our disciplinary divisions. So globalization studies, too, as a predominantly social science interdiscipline, is gradually coming to recognize that urgent global questions are rhetorically situated and geopolitically emplaced. And to see that situatedness as further complicated by transnational circulation, performance, and transformation. Yet the centrality of language to the framing of these questions is recognized less often. Mary Louise Pratt, in her article, Comparative Literature and the Global Language Scape, has this to say. It's a long quotation, but I, I think it's important. What are the linguistic dimensions of this set of planetary realignments that people call globalization? If you pick up one of the dozens of anthologies about globalization that have appeared in the last 15 years, you almost certainly will not find a chapter on language, nor even in most cases an entry for language in the index. Astonishing as it may seem, language has not even been a category of analysis in the now vast academic literature on globalization. Though some of the people who think about language think about globalization, almost none of the people who think about globalization think about language. Yet globalization has shaped the linguistic landscape of the world and global processes are directed and shaped by language at every turn. So that's the end of her quote. So this silent assumption that English can function as the default norm informs the work of many global policymakers. The World Bank 2020 strategy, Learning for All, for example, does not mention the language in which learning will take place. The 2011 report of the European Commission, Lingua Franca, Chimera, or Reality, does take the issue seriously, probably because it's written by translators. Uh, it notes that English is the working language, or one of the working languages, of all international organizations. And this report concludes that in our globalized world, where communication is the big issue, language strategies, though often ignored, play a major role. So yet the role of English as a mediating factor in establishing and enabling certain transnational connectivities and in blocking others still remains understudied. The problem has not escaped the attention of applied linguists, language teachers, and translators, yet many national policies in formerly colonized countries still privilege the language of the colonizer, often to such an extent that literacy itself is equated only with facility in English. And the author I'm thinking of here is talking mainly about Africa, but I think it's true more generally. In such context, especially when literacy becomes associated with the destruction of indigenous meaning-making systems, literacy itself is often distrusted. Emma LaRoque, in her book, When the Other is Me, Native Resistance Discourses, 1850 to 1990, notes, and I'm quoting her here, it is often taken for granted that literacy is an enormous improvement in human evolution. Those of us who come from oral traditions have quite different perspectives on literacy and on evolution. In fact, literacy becomes the enemy when printed words are used for extinguishment purposes. 
not only is English or French in Canada the vehicle for the extinguishment of Aboriginal rights, it is also the expressive means of dehumanization." End of quote. So transnational literacies must involve combating rhetorics of dehumanization and those literacy projects that promote them. They start with respect for minoritized perspectives, an openness to difference, and an ability to question the unquestioned norms that constitute dominant forms of understanding within one's own self-construction. They also involve the recognition that indigenous languages, literacies, and rhetorics are crucial to achieving a truly transnational literacy that can account for the full humanity of all peoples. Our colleague, Lynn Mario Menezes de Souza, has conducted important work in the Brazilian context over the last 20 years, investigating the ecology of writing among the Kashinawa in Brazil, demonstrating the value of these multimodal indigenous literacies for rethinking the politics of literacy and advancing Walter Mignolo's advocacy of border thinking. That is, thinking from dichotomous concepts rather than ordering the world in dichotomies. So like de Souza, I come to these questions via colonial discourse analysis and Gayatri Spivak's subsequent theorizations of transnational literacy. Uh, she uses the singular. Spivak opposes what she calls planetarity to globalization, which she defines as a neoliberal capitalist enterprise. She thinks planetarity is best imagined from the pre-capitalist cultures of the planet. It involves a way of defining the self that does not depend on opposition to a capital O other or separation from a sense of communal responsibility. To train the imagination to start thinking planetarity is to train it, in Spivak's words, to be tough enough to test its limits. That testing can occur for some through unlearning our privilege as our loss. And learning to learn from below. And learning to learn, that's the challenge. That repetition works importantly there. Transnational literacies refer to the modes of meaning making that arise as we educate ourselves in the differences of planet thought and the linguistic diversity that was closed by colonialism. Spivak insists there is no formulaic access to planetarity. And beyond posing it as an alternative to globalization, to post-colonialism and to nationalism, Spivak claims, and these are her words, I outline this utopian idea as a task for thinking ground, because otherwise a reformed comparative literary vision may remain caught within varieties of cultural relativism, specular alterity, and cyber benevolence. She fears transnational literacy may remain confined within a politics of recognizing multiculturalism or of international aid in the interest of capital D development, of which the promise of cyber literacy is increasingly a part. So she refers here to that other way in which transnational literacy is currently being used to refer to e-learning and digital literacies. Um, that language uh, that Spivak used is dense uh, and difficult, but I wanted you to hear it because of its rhetorical effect um, of forcing uh, more detailed thinking to the uncompromising nature of her vision. I think that given the instrumentalist and imperialist history of literacy, Spivak's fears seem justified. Paul Giles suggests that her resistance derives from her desire to situate the parochial multicultural debates in the United States within an international frame. That's part of it, but it's only part of it. Graham Huggins suggests that for Spivak, transnational literacy involves a pluralist understanding of the roles played by international affairs, development economics, 
and business administration, as well as cultural politics in the management of globality, which is defined primarily by Spivak as the financialization of the globe. So Hagen suggests that transnational literacy involves a complex understanding that liberation here may yet mean enslavement there, and that intellectual humility rather than informational hubris will be the basis for a decolonization of the mind. And that carries the potential for thinking, for imagining justice everywhere. So we're asking ourselves what kind of learning strategies can facilitate such a complex redefinition of literacy practices en route toward reimagining justice. Spivak articulates a utopian ideal that by definition will never reach a final fulfillment because it requires constant vigilance in a world continually undergoing transformation. The transnational literacy she advocates involves an ongoing process in which decolonizing educators remain alert to the ways in which our modes of meaning making contribute to the ongoing semiotic struggle to control how reality is defined. Like de Souza, Spivak starts from her ethnographic work with local communities whose modes of meaning making have been marginalized and misunderstood. Their work enacts what Spivak describes as learning to learn from below. But Spivak's definition of transnational literacy works differently than that often described in American US-based multicultural contexts by educational theorists such as Doris Warner. Warner sees the transnational from the perspective of the United States and largely as encompassed within it. Her idea of developing transnational literacies begins with empirical, ethnographic description of what she describes as the actual ways in which global processes and transnational flows are lived, experienced, reconstituted, and transformed at the local level by individual actors. And she expresses, though, little interest in tracing the multi-directionality of those flows or in critiquing their larger economic or ideological context. To the extent that her work interprets transnationalism almost exclusively in the context of migration to the United States, her work still operates within the optics of methodological nationalism and so I think may more appropriately be considered a contribution to migrant diasporic or multicultural literacies within a US context. Still a valuable contribution, but doing somewhat different work. The overlap and disjunctions between the processes these adjectives describe, migrant, diasporic, multicultural, transnational, require more exploration. In a later co-authored article, Warner and Lamb write, that they examine reading and writing as forms of capital production and exchange through which people are variously able to attain particular positions within and across diverse social fields. So this view of transnational literacy as fundamentally instrumental within the terms provided by the status quo is too restricted for Spivak's understanding of the term, although she too is committed to subaltern agency. Warner's definition of transnational literacies in, in yet another article, as she herself admits, leaves unanswered key questions about theory and methodology. So these are questions that our team also recognizes as essential to how we frame our empirical work. Many members of our team are also interested, like Warner, in gathering the primary data of what actually happens in various classrooms in their locations to provide a baseline for testing what works in classroom contexts and how literacies are being redefined within globalizing contexts. For these purposes, Warner's work is helpful. But our work is situated within a critical literacies framework informed by colonial discourse analysis, by Frarian modes of learning to listen, 
and Latin American decolonial critique. In this respect, Homi Baba's thoughts on rhetoric, as outlined in Gary Olson and Lynn Warsham's uh, perspective book of interviews, Race, Rhetoric, and the Postcolonial from 1999, are well worth revisiting for their insights into the rhetorical challenges faced by oppositional critics who wish to challenge hegemonic norms. Olson and Warsham summarize Ernesto Laclau's definition of hegemony as an ongoing struggle among various groups for the acceptance and ascendancy of their values and worldviews. Hence, they conclude hegemonic struggle is never ending and it relies on constant persuasion on rhetoric. Teachers of English rhetoric and literacy are then inevitably involved in this struggle. For Baba, writing is not a medium, it's a mediation. A mediation that cannot be relegated to a transparency, as if it is following from positions, objects, subjects already constituted. In the location of culture, Baba writes, I have chosen to demonstrate the importance of the space of writing and the problematic of address at the very heart of the liberal tradition because it is here that the myth of the transparency of the human agent and the reasonableness of political action is most forcefully asserted. Baba explains, what address does is draw your attention not only to the place where the sign emerges in a particular discourse or a particular speech act, but how it flies and then falls at a place of relocation. That's what address is, how it moves from one space to another. So then turning to the pre-capitalist cultures of the planet as Spivak councils well involved listening to the insistence of indigenous writers that their writing not only addresses the present, but also addresses their ancestors. This is a kind of counterintuitive movement to Western thought that challenges Western notions of time as well as space. Well, David Spur ends his 1993 book, The Rhetoric of Empire, with the claim that there is yet to be created either a tradition or even a recognizable style that would reflect an actual dialogue between the West and what is called the Third World. Much has changed since 1993, yet the 12 rhetorical modes that he identifies and maps and shows operating across a range of discourses remain recognizably in operation today. He describes them as a repertoire for colonial discourse, a range of tropes, conceptual categories, and logical operations available for purposes of representations. And his chapters name these as surveillance, appropriation, aestheticization, classification, debasement, negation, affirmation, idealization, insubstantialization, naturalization, eroticization, and resistance. These have been identified and elaborated in much more detail by later critics many times since, yet they continue with new permutations to structure many Western contemporary discourses today. Spur's own analysis led him to conclude that the work of deconstructing colonial discourse is even greater than that of dismantling the massive systems of colonial administration. It is work that has only just begun to say nothing of the creation of entirely new discourses. More optimistically, he adds, yet some encouragement may be found in the thought that in a sense, this has always been the task of writing. Today, we might wish to stress even more firmly the close links between these naturalized imperial forms of rhetoric and the institutions and policies that they legitimate. These recognitions are prompting new questions amongst sociologists about technological, political, and education institutional processes 
about the nature of global rhetorics and the publics they interpolate, and about the methods needed to study the relations among these effectively. In a world that recognizes multiple literacies, then literacy and illiteracy are always contextual and codependent. What kind of illiteracies do national imaginaries produce and what kind do they condone? And here I'm thinking about Spivak's talk about sanctioned ignorance, the kind of ignorance that it is perfectly acceptable to hold within a Western society. Within the North American context, Dana Williams and Marissa Lopez express concern about the various ways in which ethnic literatures are rendered illiterate or unreadable. Other writers express concern about the ways in which ethnic literatures are commodified within the global marketplace and in the Canadian context, the way in which these multicultural literatures are made to represent Canada overseas, even as they remain marginalized at home. <coughs> so these questions are now prompting others. How does one study the role of global interconnectedness and movement in transforming how literacy is understood and how rhetoric travels? Addressing the concerns of feminists with transnational rhetorical processes, Rebecca Dingo argues that studying the rhetoric of global institutions, conferences, and their public pronouncements is important, but not enough. Critics must also examine how rhetorics travel from their initial sites of enunciation and how they are changed in the course of their travel and then how they are implemented. And some of my Brazilian colleagues have been talking about the difference between the, the rhetoric of the Brazilian constitution and of uh, educational policy at the national level and then the gap that happens when they are translated into textbooks or into the classroom. So Dingo's concern is with how global rhetoric gets translated into public policy practice in global, national, and local sites. Comparative literary scholars are joining post-colonial writers to ask, what happens when texts move into new contexts? taken up by audiences beyond the imagination of their producers, emerging from radically different social and discursive spaces. The question that we tried to examine in the book Crosstalk that Jennifer mentioned, how do readers negotiate meaning when norms of understanding diverge? Another way of posing this question so how does the need to attend to such circulations influence textual analysis, teaching practices, and the role of ourselves as academics in the world? These are some of the questions that our research team is examining and that may be questions that you are grappling with over the next day and a half of this conference. I look forward to learning more about your research and your teaching as we explore together this challenging terrain. <laughs>